When I was in banking for a lot of years, uh, we used to give reports to committees. And so when you give a report to a committee, you always give a very concise, very tight report. You've got a lot of people sitting around the table who are pretty high up in the bank. So you make your presentations very concise. And so that's always been one of the troubles I have with sermons. My, my sermons I make as concise as possible, but then they end up being 15 minutes. <laughs> so bear with me and I'll try to do better stuff. Let's see a bank story. I'll tell you a quick bank story. Maybe I already told it. I don't know. Well, I was sitting at my desk one day, and uh, I was uh, minding my own business and taking care of some paperwork, and the door to the building right next to me flung open and hit the wall. And I, and I started looking up, and here comes this guy with a big gun. And he's yelling, don't nobody move. And he, and he went right by me. And I, I just froze. I mean, just complete fear, I froze. But then after a while, I had like a little block of wood under, the, under my desk with two buttons on it. That I'd start pressing, so I started pressing that, thinking that would help, you know. It didn't. But uh, he went on to rob the uh, bank. I don't know what he got, but uh, to this day, I remember when he was backing out the door, and he said, I got what I came for. Don't nobody move. <laughs> this is right out of a 1930s... Uh, Warner Brothers movie and stuff. So, but anyway, that's my story, Mike. Okay. All right. Okay, today we're going to talk about taking up your cross. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in society, the cross means many things, and, and it's very holy and dear to us. So it symbolizes grace and forgiveness and love. And we can see the cross everywhere, on people's necks, on steeples. Uh, in people's homes and in pictures. So, but 2,000 years ago, when, when our Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth, it meant something totally different. Um, it was something that uh, the Roman authorities used to, to execute people. And so it had sort of a hideous, hideous meaning to it. But uh, they would force convicted criminals and enemies of the state and troublemakers to carry their cross to where they're going to be crucified, and then they were crucified. And so um, the history of the cross is sort of, I guess it can be sort of interesting. It originated with the Assyrians and, uh, and Babylonians, and they used it probably well before the 6th century, 6th century BC. Alexander the Great brought it uh, to the Middle Eastern, to the Eastern Mediterranean countries about the 4th BC, and then the Roman authorities picked it up about the 3rd BC, and so they started using it. And so they... They, um, they perfected it pretty well. So the cross is characterized by a post and a cross, uh, horizontal crossbar. And it's got several variations, and they probably weighed well over 250 pounds. So anyway, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of crosses. Let's start with the first picture. actually it's because it, it it's uh, shaped like the letter Greek letter tau so and so they call it the tau cross and stuff um, similar to the tau cross and let's put a picture number two so Let's take a look at picture number number uh, two. That's more of a just a physical cross. Uh, Jesus talked to his disciples about another cross, and so his concept of the cross uh, involves making major changes and priorities in our lives. So we're going to look at three Bible verses today to learn what it means to take up your cross and to be a living sacrifice as we serve our Lord Jesus. So, um, 
Let's start with scripture number one, and that's Matthew sixteen twenty four. And so, uh, and it, and it says follows. Um, it falls into a category known as the ministry of, uh, of Jesus Christ. It starts in chapter 4 of Matthew and it proceeds through chapter 18. And so during this time of um, public ministry, our Lord traveled and spoke to synagogues. And after he was barred from there, then he did something that we call today open air preaching. And so he went to places where he could get a crowd and then he would start teaching them. And, um, and so... During this time, he had, uh, I would say, constant tensions is the best way to describe it because he always had the op opposition of religious leaders and authorities. So in chapter 16, our Lord withdraws from the public. And so what he's doing, he's taking a break. And he's going to uh, prepare his disciples for... He, what's going to happen is, is he's gone through quite a bit of the ministry, and so now it's coming to the end. And so what he wants to do is, is prepare his disciples for his arrest and, and his crucifixion. And so the theme throughout chapter 16 is faith. And so he teaches two things here. He's asking them to deny themselves and to take up the cross. And so deny yourself does not necessarily mean denying things. Rather, it means to give yourself wholly to Jesus Christ. In this particular situation, our Lord is preparing, like I said, our disciples to make major changes in their values and, and, um, and their interests, away from that of the world. And so he's telling them that they will no longer be part of Satan's world, but rather they're going to be given to Jesus, Jesus alone. And then the second thing he's telling them is to take up the cross. And that means that they're to be reconciled to the possibility of having to suffer for their beliefs and, and subject to shame as our Lord was when he was crucified. And so he's asking them to endure it and to count it worthy as part of their commitment to the work. And so I think this was probably a bit of a shocker to them because they were maybe expecting something different. So they were maybe expecting the kingdom to return right away or that they would put down the, the Roman authorities. And so we can explore this a little bit more when we go to the book of Romans. Paul goes into some additional detail of what happens when we begin the process of denying ourselves and following, following God. And the, and the book of Romans, as you know, was written by Paul to the Romans around 67 AD. And so, as with all Paul's epistles to the churches, his purpose in writing is to proclaim the glory of our Lord Jesus and to teach doctrine. And so, um, but from here, he, um, he's moving away from, starting in chapter 12, we're going to look at Romans 12, 1 through 2, if you want to turn to it. But here in chapter 12, he's, he turns from another theme uh, from the letter. From, in other words, he's turning from doctrine, and now he's going to start talking about some practical aspects of, of, of what he's doing. And so let's, uh, let's read Romans 12, 1 through 2. Um, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view here he's asking us to give uh, give our bodies and then he's asking us to, to to give our minds to the work and so before we were saved starting with our bodies um, we probably lived lives that were probably not perfect and I certainly didn't um, I remember an event in my life when I was growing up uh, I liked to drink a lot when I was younger. And so I, after a while, I stopped drinking. I couldn't take it anymore. But, 
But I remember I used to go to parties quite a bit, especially when I was in college. Did you do that, Mike? Mm -hmm. Oh, he missed a lot of good times. I was a stoic. <laughs> but I remember going to a party one night and drinking probably way too much. And so um, I had a brand new SS396 Chevelle at that time, and I uh, decided to go down Winding Way, if anybody knows about Winding Way. Chris does. He, lives on, he lived on Winding Way. And so I took that car down Winding Way about 80, 90 miles an hour. Of course, you can't. So I ended up hitting a tree. And so that, that changed my life quite a bit, too. So, But anyway, the, the point is, is um, now that we've given ourselves to, to Christianity, we've become Christians, now we have to be careful to practice temperance, soberness, and chastity. And so now we belong to God and we have to use our bodies to serve and obey our Lord Jesus Christ, to glorify him with acts of righteousness and faith and to present our bodies as a living sacrifice every day. And then with regards to our mind, the second point is, is uh, it performs the process of discrimination. It, in other words, we are every day looking at making decisions, whether good or bad. We are every day uh, addressing situations that might be sinful, and, 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 uh, and so we have to make certain decisions about how we live our lives. So, um, and so as a result, what happens is, is the world wants to distract you. The world wants to bring in false teachings. They want to pull you off to one side and stuff. But what he's saying here is, is that we have to have a transformed mind. In other words, you have to have a changed mind. And that, does, and that happens by the Holy Spirit. And so he wants, uh, he wants us to get away and start making right decisions and stuff. And so one of the things I've noticed that over the years, I often wondered, how does Satan blind somebody? And I said, how does he do that? And so I, I looked it up and I read about it and I thought about it. And so the way he does that is, is he'll give you a thousand options. There's the truth that sits there and then he'll give you a thousand choices to make. He'll give you all kinds of options to choose from. And if you're really paying too much attention to the world, you're not paying attention to, to what's important. And so that's what's happening here is he's constantly distracting you. And so... Uh, one of the things that we can help our minds to be more concentrated and to maybe follow the right path is, is stick to your Bible. And so God gave us the Bible for a specific reason. It's because it's fixed, it's true, and it doesn't change. And so we have the truth that's given to us. And so that helps us with our mind. So, uh, so let's move to the... Uh, to the Gospel of Luke here. Um, this verse falls into a section. We're going to look at uh, Luke 14, 27. Um, this verse falls into the, sec to the section of the Gospel called the Road to the Cross. And so up until this time, Jesus healed and proclaimed the Gospel and fed the multitude. And so now he's going to turn his attention to the disciples. He's going to prepare them for what's coming. And so, um, and so let's, let's read it real quick here. Luke 14, 27. And so what's, uh, what's going to go on here is, is he's warning them and he's preparing them. And so... Um, I want to talk a little bit about what, what was happening with our Lord. Uh, he was using a lot of miracles and doing lots of special things to get people's attention. He was also being kind to people and he cared for the poor and he cared for the sick. But these opportunities also gave him the ability to reach people. In other words, back then you didn't have billboards, you didn't have radios, and you didn't have computers. What you had was is events where you could uh, get people very interested and, and they, they'll see what you're doing and stuff. And so, and so that's what was going on with our Lord. 
And so, but over time, uh, our, our Lord's popularity had grown and curiosity had attracted throngs and throngs of people. And so as a result, a great multitude followed him. But um, the great multitude are also made up of religious authorities as well as friends and disciples. And so they followed him, the Messiah, uh, as the multitude followed him, their view of the Messiah was sort of distorted. So in other words, they were there, many of them were there for spectacle, many of them were there for help, many, of them, many were there because they were suffering. But there was also, you know, a lot of events going on that just drew everybody in and stuff. And so, what our Lord had to do at this point is, is he had to sort of draw his group together and stuff. And so he, um, he had to sort of thin the crowd, so to speak. I know it's a, it's a funny way of saying that. but So in verses 25 and 26, he lays out for the public what's going to be required for them if, 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 uh, if they want to follow him. And so he says to follow him, they would have to forsake family and friends as part of their commitment to the work. And so when people hearing this, it sort of startled them. In other words, what does that mean? That means I'm going to have to give up on my friends and my family and stuff. And so he did that because he was basically letting them know just how serious are you in following, in following me. And so our, our Lord, what he did was, is he, he, he sort of went to extremes to get people's attention, and that actually caused quite a few to, to depart from him. So knowing this now, he's got his disciples with him and those who are, who are serious. And so, but they were, uh, they were basically a, a, a long ways from understanding what the meaning of the cross was. So now Jesus was going to clue them in and, and uh, begin to teach them what's required. He did not want lukewarm believers or ones that were distracted by work and family. So looking, uh, he was looking to have those who were, who were going to call him Lord and come after him do the work. And so this was sort of an important, important uh, fact that had to sort of be, that had to transpire. And so he was going to turn these, this group of people and his followers into a small group that would ultimately turn the work of what the church has done into a worldwide uh, massive work that goes on today. And so he was preparing them because he wanted them to care and to teach Christians and he wanted them to proclaim the gospel in the world. So these disciples would have to be faced, they were going to be faced with stiff resistance and, they, and he knew that they would be attacked and imprisoned, which in fact did happen. And so he prepared them. He said, if you're going to follow me, he said, uh, you're going to have to carry the cross. So, so let's look at some practical examples of, of where does that leave us. In my travels as a Christian, I come across a lot of people who, who claim that they're believers. And while I'm always happy to hear this, I never know maybe inside just maybe how serious are they? And I know that's sort of an odd statement, but I, I often wonder, have you taken up the cross? Have you denied yourself? Have you really made that commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ? And so let's take a look at some practical examples of, of, of what this might entail. And so, so do we come before God with a repentant and humble heart? When we sin, do we, are we sorry for the sins that we commit? And so, in, in other words, are you even aware sometimes of what your sins are? And sometimes we all have to go through some self-examination. And that's, that's sort of the practical aspect of being, of, of being a Christian. You have to sort of see the habits, the, the kind of habits that you have in your life that maybe you were thought were not that bad. I have a tendency to say when I'm watching TV or when I'm hearing something, I said, that guy's nothing but a fool. And you know, you, you think that, but, but then you remember what, what our Lord said about calling people fools and stuff. And so, so it's the little things in your life you begin to examine and you begin to pay attention to. And so that's what our Lord wants us to do is to really get down and start looking at how we're conducting our lives as Christians. 
And so, and so let's look at some practical examples of, uh, I always like practical examples. Self-help and that kind of stuff. I enjoy that. So do we come before the Lord with a repentant and humble heart? Are we confessing our sins daily? And so that's what it requires. But let me put it into proper context. While God ultimately forgives us of our sins, and you always have to remember that he will forgive us. We're saved. We have the Holy Spirit within us, and we're, and we're, we're Christian. And so the sacrifice has been made, and we're saved. But what happens with when you, when you let sin into your life and you don't pay attention to it, what happens is it starts blocking your relationship with God. And so that's, uh, and so it's not a great relationship. You don't pray as well as you should. You don't try as hard as you should. Not that you, you're not trying to save yourself by, by not sinning, but this is what's required of us. We, we're repentant. And so we have to look at our lives carefully and to make sure that you know, we're, we're doing the best that we can. And so there's a sacrifice of righteousness. Do we live an upright and honest life? And so... So in other words, are we, are we uh, lying to maybe protect other people's feelings? That's a thought. Are we fudging on our taxes? Those, those are the kind of things that basically say living upright and being honest. And so our daily sacrifice is to work, uh, it's to work daily to do the best that we can in our spiritual lives. The sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Do we take time to honestly and sincerely thank God for, for the good that he does for us in our daily lives? I've, I learned that lesson well last fall. I went through quite a bit of suffering. I uh, had a lot of problems with grief and stuff. And uh, had a lot of problems with, with insomnia. And God has healed me of that now. And I thank him every day for that. And so I, uh, I always want to make sure I thank God for something every day. Because he's done much for us. And so he's, he's really done uh, quite a bit for us. The sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. So in other words, do we, sac do, we, do we thank God daily? The sacrifice of giving to churches or, or the poor. The sacrifice of helping others around us without the expectation of acknowledgement. I have down here the sacrifice of forsaking family and friends for the work, and I, I know that's, uh, we, we talked about that before, but sometimes there's, there's people in your family that just don't understand what you're doing. They don't like what you do, and somehow it strains the relationship, and you have to sort of be ready for that to stand up. You don't necessarily have to forsake them, in other words, kick them out, but you have, to endure, you have to endure some of those trials and stuff. Uh, when I was younger, I had friends that maybe I shouldn't have had. And so that's a sacrifice. I've given up a lot of friends over the years. It happens. It happens when you get older, too. You lose a lot of them. <laughs> so. so anyway, the final point I want to make here is, is being not conformed to this world. And so before I get into that, I, I, I want to say that this world is a highly connected world of foundations, colleges, businesses, media, social media, and they all seem at times to line up against the Christians. I see that from time to time, and, and I've over the years begun to realize that maybe this world really is Satan's world. I've seen practical examples of it, and I've, I've begun to pay attention. So... But we don't we don't live in a dangerous we don't live in a, a dangerous environment like the original apostles did in the um, in the first century. They had to put their lives on the line. They they um, they were going to suffer and 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 surrender their lives for the work. We don't have to do that yet. So, but the question is is how serious about are you about leaving the world? In other words, are we? Are we devo devoted to the world's treasures and philosophies and priorities? So, and so you have to sort of look at your life carefully, and so we need to set our priorities according to God's system, according to his values. And so John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. And that's an interesting statement because we can make idols out of anything. And I've done that in my life. I've, uh, I've had hobbies take over my life, and I've paid too much attention to them. 
looking back, you can see that now. So, But uh, we have to be weary of, of the world, and we have to realize that it competes, it competes with us every day for, for our attention and, and, for, and to distract us. So, so what have we learned today? We have to take up our cross. We have to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, both in mind and body. And we, and we should not be conformed to the world. So that's my, uh, that's my sermon today. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you. So, um, let's see. Let's, let's close in prayer. Most holy Father, thank you for giving us, a, giving us an opportunity to come together today, Father. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you, Father, for just helping us to be together and not, not separated like we were before. Father, always being together and fellowshipping is, uh, is, is, the, is the best way for us to, to love one another, to help one another. But Father, for those who can't be with us, bless them also and help them to tune in and to, to see the message and to see our, our, our joy of assembling together here and, and to just bless them also, Father. And Father, we thank you for giving us freedom, Father, to speak the truth and to go into the world and to live as, as free people. And so, Father, I know that many people worldwide those in Afghanistan and North Korea, those in China and the Middle East, those in Africa, those in Cuba, and, and other places in this world, Father, they, they face persecution each and every day. And so, Father, we pray for them that you just help them and that you have mercy upon them, Father, and that you just strengthen them, which we, we know that you always do. You give us the strength to face every situation that we have in our lives. So thank you. Thank you, Father. And we most humbly ask this in your Son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, and amen. Okay. I guess we'll do the... Uh, the uh, I hope it comes up because I can't remember it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay.